What a lovely morning. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, speak to us, please. I guess uh, you, like everyone else, have asked the question, what's life all about? I doubt there's a person living or has ever lived who has not asked that question, what are we here for? What's it all about? Where are we going? Is there a heaven? Is there a hell? Is this all there is? And those questions have been the subject of uh, philosophy since time immemorial. People have asked those questions. But there's a book in the Bible where those questions are asked. Actually, there's more than one book where those questions are asked. But one in particular is the book of Ecclesiastes. And uh, I'm going to go right through that book this morning. And uh, don't get troubled, I've truncated this down to five hours. Uh, so don't worry. We'll be out of here before 12 o'clock. Okay, so don't worry. We're actually going to start a series on a Tuesday night, once a fortnight. We're going to have some tables out and we're going to have some coffee and tea. And we're going to meet together and we're going to go through some of the books of the Bible in one. To get a, I've, I've suggested we call it the wood for the trees, all right? And we're just going to go through in less than an hour one book of the Bible. It won't all be me doing, doing this, there'll be other subjects that uh, will be interspersed between those. But I'm going to give you a little taste of this morning and we're going to go through the book of Ecclesiastes in a record time. It's a strange book, it's a strange word. Ecclesiastes. Now, <clears throat> the word ecclesia is the Greek word for church. Ecclesiastes is, is the name of a pastor, really, a person who, who is in the church whose responsibility or one of their responsibility is to preach, is to teach the Word of God, one who speaks about the meaning of life. And, and uh, if you've got your book, uh, your Bibles, and you can find Ecclesiastes, you know, I learnt the order of the books of the Bible when I was a boy in Sunday school, but I still struggle when I'm in church and someone says, let's, book, let's read from the, the book Hezekiah. Uh, you know there's no such book, but people struggle through. Even now I struggle to find some of those minor prophets. So don't worry, Ecclesiastes, it starts like this. The words of the preacher, the son of David in Jerusalem. Now that word preacher there means one who collects something. One who collects something. This book was written by King Solomon and he'd collected things. He'd collected philosophies. He'd collected thoughts and he's now going to share them with us. Now there seems to be inbred in the human race a dissatisfaction. My 19 year old, uh, one of my, my grandsons who's 19, he's just bought the top of the range Mini. It sounds more like a racing car when you drive it. And it uses petrol at a huge rate and I told him not to buy it but he didn't listen to me. They never do, do they? Uh, but anyway, he's bought it and he's putting a, so much petrol in it every week. And I saw him last week and he wants to get something else now. There's a dissatisfaction. There's something that's dissatisfied. He's got to find something else. And it's there and seems to be innate in the human experience. <clears throat> and advertisers know all about this, of course. They know very, they're very clever and they exploit those things uh, for the benefit of their clients. People are searching for something illusory, something elusive, something that they cannot uh, find. And Solomon made this search and became very disillusioned and very, very cynical. In fact, 37 times in the book you'll find that phrase, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. It's useless. Life is useless. It's not just vanity now, this is vanity of vanities. This is the, the very height of vanity, the height of uselessness. Life's useless. Have you ever felt that way? Well, if you have, you're just like everybody else. Without God, that is. <clears throat> and um, 
He's a pessimist. You don't want to invite him to your party. He's a misery. He's a pessimist. He's, he's really downhearted. And yet he starts like this in verse 3. What profits a man for all his labour in which he toils under the sun? What is the point of working? What is the point? Uh, there's never any satisfaction. There's, there seems to be no end to it. And we find another phrase in the book, 29 times, he keeps saying, under the sun, under the sun. <clears throat> A meaning, life on this earth, under the sun. One generation passes away and another comes, but the earth abides forever. It's also predictable, birth, life, death, and on it goes in this wearisome round as he sees it the sun rises verse 5 and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it arose now if you go on to google now you'll find the exact time that the sun will go down tonight it's as predictable as can be and it'll come up tomorrow tomorrow morning um, and and he's finding all this very pessimistic and um the wind blows south, then north, around and around it goes. The rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. He's, n he's looking now at the hydrological uh, sequence of life, how the clouds rise over the sea and, the, and they're, they're blown over the land and the rain falls into the, into the rivers and back into the sea. Oh, it's so wearisome as he sees it. And um, history just repeats itself. Now, are you beginning to feel depressed? Well, that's, that's Solomon's, that's Solomon's uh, uh, way of thinking. Now, if we were talking to an atheist, we would use these things as an evidence of God, wouldn't we? We would say, we would say yeah, the fact that the sun rises and the sun sets and the water goes round, this is a wonderful example of the fact that there is a creator and it is God. But he's not feeling like that at the moment. Verse 12. The teacher was king of Israel and I lived in Jerusalem. I devoted myself to search for understanding and to explore by wisdom everything being done under heaven. I soon discovered that God has dealt a tragic existence to the human race. I observed everything going on under the sun and really it's all meaningless like chasing the wind. What is wrong cannot be made right. What is missing cannot be recovered. I said to myself, look, I am wiser than any of the kings who ruled in Jerusalem before me. I have greater wisdom and knowledge than any of them. So I set out to learn everything from wisdom to madness and folly. But I learned firsthand <coughs> that pursuing all this is like chasing the wind. The greater my wisdom, the greater my grief. To increase knowledge only increases sorry. Sorry. Because the more you know, the more depressed you are. Actually, you can find people like that. <laughs> you know, they go to university, they get PhDs, and they learn philosophy, and to hear them speak, it would make anyone miserable. Their wisdom actually is making them even more miserable. But uh, there it is. So he, he starts off with this experiment. Now, Solomon reigned for 39 years, and each year he received 25 tons of gold. Imagine that. <clears throat> uh, it's, it's estimated that his, his, I say his net worth, it hardly matters, his net worth, possibly, possibly, who knows, was in the region of 1.5 trillion pounds. This was a rich man. This was a man who had everything. And he decides he's going to set... An experiment. Verse chapter 2. See, we're already in chapter 2 and no time has passed. I said to myself, come on. Now I'm, I'm reading from, a, um, from, a, from a, a translation here. Don't worry. Don't w Listen, people say, well, must we read the King James Version? No. I say to people, read the, read the translation which you find easiest at the moment. I've just sent a a new Christian, uh, some, uh, uh, the, me the Message Bible, she's enjoying it, she's enjoying it, it's a good start, you know, let's, go, let's, go, no, let's not get snobbish about it, alright, 
let's, let's read the scriptures and study the scriptures. I said to myself, come on, let's try pleasure, let's look for the good things in life. But I found this too was meaningless, so I said, laughter is silly. What good does it do to seek pleasure? After much thought, I decided to cheer myself with wine. And while still seeking wisdom, I clutched at foolishness. In this way, I tried to experience the only happiness most people find during their brief life in this world. It goes on. I also tried to find meaning by building huge homes for myself, planting beautiful vineyards. I made gardens and parks, filling them with all kinds of fruit. I built reservoirs to collect the water to irrigate my many flourishing groves. I brought slaves. Both men and women and others were born into my household. And I also owned large herds of flocks, more than any of the kings who had lived in Jerusalem before me. I collected great sums of silver and gold and treasure of many kings and provinces. I hired wonderful singers, both men and women, had many beautiful concubines. I had everything a man could desire. He had 700 wives, poor man, and 300 concubines for his sexual pleasure. He had, he had everything. And, um, but the hole somehow in his soul just got bigger. <coughs> That's the problem. And then you get to chapter 3 and the really monotonous chapter. And those who are old enough will, re old enough will remember a group called the birds. The birds. B-Y-R-D-S, who sang this song during the Vietnam debacle. <clears throat> it's a sort of a peace song. And it's a direct quote from <coughs> the King James Version. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. Here he goes, look, time to be born, time to die, time to plant. Time to pluck what is planted, time to kill, time to heal, time to break down, time to build up, time to weep. Oh, it's such misery. A time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing, a time to gain and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence <coughs> and a time to speak. Time to love, time to hate, time of war, and a time of peace. Wow. What a monotonous, repetitive life it is, according to Solomon. But he starts to mention God, and there's a glimmer of hope. You'll know when God comes into the equation, there's hope. Without God, life is utterly useless. Pointless. There's no greater tragedy than someone dying without coming to the conclusion that you and I have been put on this earth for a purpose. That we've been made in the image of God. I've just, just written to my son saying that very thing. You're made in the image of God. You have, you have, you have an innate worth in and of yourself that God has made you. And God has made you for a purpose. You see, he's now beginning to look up. He's been looking inward. Now he's looking upward. Verse 14, And I know this, that whatever God does is final. Nothing can be added or taken from it. God's purpose in this is that man should fear the all-powerful God. Whatever it has been long ago, and whatever is going to be has been before, God brings to pass again what was in the distant past and disappeared. Moreover, I notice that throughout the earth, justice is giving way to crime and even the police courts are corrupt. I said to myself, in due season, God will judge everything man does, both good and bad. Which Sheila and I were walking in the park this week and there was a man trying to teach his child how to ride a bike. Now, I taught my twins our twins, they're 19 now, but I taught them both how to ride a bike and I learned something. And this man hadn't learned this and this poor kid kept, well he wasn't falling off because his dad kept holding him, but he was looking down at the handlebars. You'll never ride a bike like that. 
And, and my, as, soon as, as soon as our twins discovered that you have to look up, they were away. They got their balance. They were moving forward. Now, Solomon is just looking inwards. He's making that great mistake. And uh, he's starting to look upwards uh, to God. Corrie Ten Boom said this, Look around and be distressed. Look within and be depressed. Look above and find rest. Isn't that wonderful? Look around and get distressed. Don't you get distressed? I've spent some time in hospital lately, either with Sheila or myself. We seem to spend most of our time these days in hospital for tests and various things like some of you do. And you look around and don't you get distressed? I do. I, I get so distressed. I, I, I look and see the, 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 the awful weariness of illness and 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 so on i see people trying to get off their chairs you know and they're all stiff and they can hardly do it some of us know what that's like already and you get depressed and distressed about it and then you look inside and get dis depressed but according to ten Boom says look up and find <clears throat> rest look up and get your balance look up and get your balance and then chapter four he, he, he he begins his Proverbs, you know, Solomon was a great man for Proverbs. There's a book written, isn't there? He goes into his Proverbs. He, he talks about the tears of the oppressed don't have a comforter. He thought that the dead were better off than the living. And uh, most fortunate of all, he says, are those that have never been born in the first place. Oh dear. It goes on. And... Um, then in verse 9, he, gets, he talks about the value of a friend. That's interesting. He says, one person is not right by themselves. Two's better. Three is even better. You and I were never meant to live by ourselves. One third, I gather, of the population of Great Britain lives alone. That's, that's just the way it is. But we're not meant to be alone. Solomon said we, we, need, we need friends. This is part of the church and the function, the fellowship, the being together, the sharing of griefs, the, the sharing of joys, the holding on to one another, the support of one another. I've been glad of the support of people in the church over the years. We need to support each other. We need to share with each other. It's not good enough to meet on a Sunday morning and say, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. That's the English way. We need to share. Sometimes privately, just to share, so that there's a support for us. Sometimes we can't bear it by ourselves. We need someone else. And Solomon talks about this. And he says, but even better, a third person. And this is particularly so in marriage, isn't it? Um, the stress and strain of life is very real, even in a marriage. But when Jesus is there, when God is there, when that third strand is there, well, a threefold cord is not easily broken. And those of us who have had successful marriages, we need to say, thank you, Lord. Not everyone has. And we need to be very conscious of that. And then he goes on in chapters 5 to 10. Look how quickly we're going through. In chapters 5 to 10, he says, He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver. It's just emptiness. Now, most people actually, I think, rely on money. They rely on money. Um, it's the, it's the kind of the foundation of their lives. Whereas the Christian relies on the Lord Jesus Christ, relies on God. And he says this, the sleep of the laboring man is sweet whether he eat little or much but the abundance of the rich will not permit him to sleep i wonder how much sleep solomon got i imagine he he was not very good at sleeping he probably looked at his gardeners and they were sleeping much better 
He was struggling to sleep. He got insomnia. He was worrying about all kinds of things. I wonder if he'd get his 25 tons of gold this year or whatever, or, or, or all the plans he had to make. And then in chapter 7, he says this, verse 1, A good name is better than precious ointment. Now listen to this. Actually, I gave uh, Jelu this advice yesterday morning. Better go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. He was off to a wedding. <laughs> For that is the end of all men and the living will take it to heart. Actually, if you're invited to a funeral and a wedding on the same day, Solomon said it'd be better if you went to the funeral. Sheila and I were walking around Battersley Clinton the other day in the little churchyard and wandering around the graveyards. And this sounds depressive, doesn't it? Far from it, actually. And we were reading the inscriptions. There was a lovely inscription going back to 18-something, and it just said this, I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me and rest. That's lovely. But you see, you walk around the graveyard and you say, goodness, Sheila, this person died at 20. Or here's a little baby. And you begin to think. And then you find people of your age and younger than you and you begin to think. You begin to think. And this is what he's getting at. Better go to the house of mourning than the house of feasting. I remember taking, well how could I forget, I've taken lots of funerals over the years, but the one that stuck most in my mind is the funeral of a young man, I've mentioned it before here, who was kicked to death outside of a pub in Chelmsley Wood. And hundreds turned up at Woodland Cemetery. So many they couldn't get them in. There must have been three or four hundred young people and they stood around the, the pulpit with me and their faces in that stark reality of death, they were beginning to think. A good name is better than precious ointment, better go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will take it to heart. That's what he's saying. Sorrow is better than laughter, he says. Wow. The Arabs have a saying that sunshine makes the desert. There's a lovely little poem by Robert Browning that goes like this. I walked a mile with pleasure. She chatted all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow and ne'er a word said she, but oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. If you want counsel, find someone that knows about sorrow. If you want counsel, don't find someone that's just kind of drifted through life. Find someone that's known Sorrow, suffering in the hands of God is a useful, useful tool. You, all of us, if not most of us in this room have suffered sorrow. A trouble-free life is a shallow life. You must be struggling. You may be struggling this morning with bereavement. You may be struggling with family. You may be struggling with sons or daughters or, or whatever or or all kinds of things, you may be suffering. Well, look at it this way. This is the hand of God that you may know. Sorrow. It's right. It's not wrong. It's producing character. It's deepening us. We're going down further. Although at times we could tear our hair out. That's the way it is. I walked a mile with sorrow and ne'er a word said she, but oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. Now, 
Here are some examples from the scriptures. It was good for me to be afflicted that I might learn your decrees, said David. 2 Timothy 3.12 Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Colossians 1.24 Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body which is the church. Galatians, here it is again, carry each other's burdens. We must do this. Carry each other's burdens that you might fulfill the law of Christ. Jesus said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Aren't you looking forward to that day when he will wipe away every tear? Yes. There'll be no more tears. There'll be no more death. And there Solomon is using all these human reasonings. Some are true and some are not. Some are utterly depressive and some are accurate. And then you come to 11 and 12, the last two chapters, and it's only quarter to 12. When he talks about seeking God early in your life. Did you know statistically... Most people come to Christ before they're 50. Those are the statistics. There aren't many people who come to Christ in their old age. And this is what Solomon is telling us. He's talking about, he says this, let me paraphrase, it's a wonderful thing to be alive. If a person lives to be very old, let him rejoice in every day of his life. Hallelujah. Those of us who are old, when you wake up in the morning, rejoice, you've got another day. <laughs> Hallelujah. As you stiffly get out of bed, as you try and move those arthritic joints, and you get out, thank God he's given us another day, another opportunity. But he's saying, look, look, <clears throat> eternity is far longer and everything down here is futile in comparison. He says it's a wonderful thing to be young. I don't know how you clash, when you, as you get older, young becomes relative, doesn't it? <clears throat> but if you're young, he says, enjoy yourself. Have a good life. But don't forget this, that you'll be judged one day on your life. You'll have to give an account. And then in the final chapter, don't let the excitement of being young cause you to forget about your Creator. Honour Him in your youth before the evil years come, when you'll no longer enjoy living. It will be too late then to try and remember Him, when the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are dim in your old eyes, and there is no silver lining left among the clouds. One of the... Um, uh, signs of old age is the loss of memory. He's talking about it here, it's in a poetic form. Um, you know, I, I'm experiencing the loss of words. Words, not, not big words, not clever words, but just ordinary words. Um, I find I begin a sentence and then I can't think of a word that I've used for 74, well not quite 74 years, but, but a, a number of years. I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to notice that. People have short-term memories. Sometimes, of course, it, it gets very serious. But it's part of growing old. And um, in the days when the keepers of the house tremble, these are the arms, aren't they? They hand loose. They're not, they're not quite as defensive as they used to be. <laughs> The, the, the days when the keepers of the house trouble, the strong men bow down, the legs begin to go. You know, I was in Solihull Hospital having uh, my, a, a blood test this year, I think it was this year, I'm hopeless. And I, I got out of my car and uh, forgot something, walked 100 yards, got, went back again, forgot something, went back again the second time hoping no one was going to see this silly old man. And uh, then I started to walk to the haematology department and tripped over and banged my head. 
and uh, they had to call an ambulance because there's no accident and emergency at the hospital. And now whenever I go for a blood test, I walk with such care. You know, I realise how easy it is to trip when you get older. I realise how easy it is to fall over when you're losing your balance. And this is what he's saying. The strong men bow down. The grinders cease. Well, we know what that is. The grinders cease because they are few, says Solomon. The teeth begin to fall out. They, they, they're, not, they're, not as, they're not as good as they used to be if you've happily got some left. Those that look through the windows are dim. The cataracts begin. Oh, this is a depressing warning, isn't it? The cataracts begin. I can be much more depressive than this man. <laughs> you need glasses. You know, you're reading like this. And uh, this is what he's saying. This is what he's saying. When one... <laughs> When, rise, when one rises up at the sound of a bird, all that kind of deep sleep that you knew when you was young, were young is gone now, and the slightest little thing wakes you up. Uh, all the daughters of music are brought low, our hearing begins to diminish. David and I have got this battery swap arrangement. And uh, if he's, you see, if you've got a hearing aid, you know that it, it gives you a sort of a warning that it's about to expire. The back goes, da, 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 and then a few minutes later it goes, da, da, and eventually, it, cause, now David and I know this. <laughs> David and I know this. And we both, can, we both carry bas, um, uh, batteries, and, and we swap batteries. And it's a fellowship thing. It's a fellowship thing. And they are afraid of height and the terrors of the way. Uh, there it is. The almond tree blossoms. The hair begins to go white. Uh, or grey, depending on what colour it was before it went to whatever colour it goes. The grasshopper is a burden. Well now, when you, when you wake up in the morning, it's more difficult to get out of bed. You used to jump out of bed, spring out of bed, but no more. It's all beginning to... Now, what he's saying is this, remember your creator while you're young, before the difficult days come, before death comes. Now, we know modern medicine has helped us in all these things, hearing aids and all kind of things. But ultimately, death comes. And, and Solomon says, man goes to his eternal home. And the, the body finally crumbles and goes to dust. And after all his philosophy, after all his collection of sayings, after all his proverbs, after all his experiment, after all he had done, he comes to a conclusion that life under the sun is empty, it's futile, and um, he says this, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge, he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. And I've been thinking about this. Those of us who preach have to be so careful that we connect with the people with whom we are preaching. That's what Solomon is saying. He considered it. He considered what he was saying. He made sure that he got the right proverbs. He pondered, he thought. And uh, we, we must do the same. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandment, for this is man's all. Now, if in your Bible, in chapter 13, in chapter 12, you've got the word duty, I suggest you pencil it out. It's not the right word at all. This is the whole duty of man. That's not what it says. Does that what it says in your NIV? Yeah, that's not correct. In fact, it does not convey the meaning at all. It's not there in the Hebrew. Fear God, keep his commandments, here's the word, for this is the wholeness of man. Or, or if you read the King James, the New King James, it says, for this is man's all. If you want to be whole, if you want fear to go, if you want the secret of being a whole person, if you don't want to be a broken person, a confused person, this is the thing, to fear God and keep his commandments. Well, how do we fear God? Well, first of all, we have to believe he is. He is. 
Creation shouts it. That which is going on in your heart tells you that God exists. He that comes to God must believe that he is, and he is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Know that he's the God of grace. Hallelujah. He's the God of grace this morning. He's the God of mercy. He's the God of love. Yes, he's the God of judgment. Two. But this morning, this is the dispensation of grace. It's the time of grace. It's the time of mercy. Know that. And he's ready to forgive. And he sent his son, S-O-N. You can live life under the S-O-N not under the S-U-N. And he's died for us and taken our sin and risen for us. We have to come with our guilt and our sin and seek his mercy and approach him with awe and wonder and fear and receive him and allow him to give us a new heart. And finally to resolve in our hearts, we'll follow him, we'll obey him, we'll keep his commandments. So there it is, the book of Ecclesiastes, in a nutshell. There's a great hole in the soul of man that can only, only be filled by God himself. And oh, I pray that God will, in these days, save men and women. In this little corner here, that God will bring to this place and we shall come into contact with those who need to hear these things, who've tried everything and failed, and that God will fill every seat, every seat, standing room only, with those who are seeking God. And here's the promise, if you seek me, with all of your heart, you'll find me. And you'll discover that I am a loving God who has done everything for you. And this is the time to turn to me and to trust me. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the lessons that we learn from this book. We thank you for the book, which is your word, the Bible. Teach us, Lord, please, we pray. Lord, thank you that we've been able to meet and worship you this morning. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for sending him. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. May we know, Lord, the filling of the Spirit in these days. Bring, Lord, to the church here an experience of the knowledge of the presence of God and the moving of the Holy Spirit among us. Lord, cause us not to fear the Holy Spirit in the sense that we avoid him, but on the contrary, Lord, fill us with the Holy Spirit this morning. Bring to us, Lord, every gift. We thank you, Lord, that each of us has been given gifts by your Spirit. Lord, severally as he will, your word says. May we see, Lord, the manifestation of these things in these days for the benefit of all, that, Lord, your church may be built up and that we might know the presence of God here among us more and more and more, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.